Uh, This morning, we're going to be finishing John chapter 7. Uh, Last week, remember, Jesus gave that, um, that gospel invitation on the final day, the great day of the feast, when the water was being poured out on the altar. He says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. John says he was speaking of the spirit that was going to be poured out once Jesus was glorified. Now, this morning, in the last part of the chapter, we, we see pretty much the uh, concluding reactions of the people who heard Jesus. What did they think? And how did they respond to him? So let's read about it, beginning in verse 40 uh, through the end of the chapter, verse 53. John, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes this. Some of the people, therefore, when they heard these words, were saying, this certainly is the prophet. Others were saying, this is the Christ. Still others were saying, surely the Christ is not going to come from Galilee, is he? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the descendants of David and from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So a division occurred in the crowd because of him. Some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said to them, Why did you not bring him? The officers answered, Never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. The Pharisees then answered them, You have not also been led astray, have you? No one of the rulers or Pharisees has believed in him, has he? But this crowd, which does not know the law, is accursed. Nicodemus, he who came to him before, being one of them, said to them, Our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing, does it? They answered him, You are not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. Everyone went to his home. May the Lord again bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now again, remember last week we saw Jesus give the invitation. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The first question I want to ask this morning is, have you thought about that offer? Have you responded to that offer? Have you received Jesus? Have you come to him? Have you drunk of this fountain of life which is able to give you life? The world, remember, is never going to be able to satisfy you at all. I mean, there are, again, we recognize there are things in the world that are fun. They're fun for a season, but like everything else, they, they wear off because they can only give you so much pleasure. You get tired of them. Uh, even those things that we first get that are new, that are so exciting, eventually the, the joy wears off and it just becomes secondhand. But the Lord gives us something that will never uh, wear out, will never grow tired of because it is infinite Love. It is like a well of water springing up, continually satisfying, continually bringing to us contentment. If you haven't found that contentment in the Lord Jesus Christ, then come to him and find it this morning. Find that satisfaction. Now this morning, John tells us how the people responded to this offer that um, that Jesus gave and to everything that he had said and all the miracles that he had performed at the feast. Some of them thought that Jesus was a phony. He couldn't be the Christ. He had nothing to offer but a lie. He was a deceiver. Some thought he might be somebody important, uh, maybe the prophet that Moses said the Lord would send, while others actually believed that Jesus was who he said he was, that he is the Messiah. Now, of course, we also see in this text that, you know, um, how what they thought about him had a strong bearing on how they responded to him. Of course, those who believed that he was the Messiah received him, and they were saved. But those who thought he was a liar, or who knew that he wasn't a liar but but hated him anyway, rebuked, well, basically, they, they renewed their hatred against him, and they rebuked the officers who came to them for not arresting him and they rebuked Nicodemus for defending him. And they called down a curse upon the crowd that believed in him. This crowd is accursed. Now this reminds us, of course, that there are 
varying responses to Jesus Christ. Not everybody's going to love him. Some people aren't. But it also reminds us that you will respond to Jesus according to what you think about him, according to what you believe about him. And uh, what you believe will show itself in your actions. If you believe something, you're going to behave a certain way. It's also true that if you behave a certain way and yet you say you believe something and your actions are contrary to what you believe, you really don't believe to be true what you believe to be true. I believe that this section really calls us to examine our own lives. What do we believe? And are we responding according to what we actually do believe regarding the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we, are we responding in an appropriate and consistent way? So this morning, let's ask these two questions. Who do you think Jesus is? And secondly, um, how are you responding to him? Is it in a way consistent with your belief? Well, first of all, let's consider who the Jews thought that Jesus was and how they responded. John tells us that, again, not surprisingly, the Jews were divided over Jesus. They were all firm in their conviction, but they didn't all agree on what they should think about him, on who he was. John writes in verse 40, Some of the people, therefore, when they heard these words, were saying, This certainly is the prophet. Now again, I would just remind you that the Jews in that day had the ex an expectation. They believed that the Lord had promised to send three important individuals to them at some time in the future. Of course, they were hoping it would be then, and as a matter of fact, it was then. And those three persons were the Christ, Elijah, and the prophet. Now we see this, that, that um, uh, well, when the Jews sent messengers to John the Baptist to find out who he was, they wanted to find out if John was one of these three important persons. Uh, we actually saw this earlier in John chapter 1, verses 19 through 25. This is the testimony of John when the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? So that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him and said to him, why then are you baptizing if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And we'll stop the reading there. Again, the Jews had an expectation the Lord was going to send these three persons. Now the prophet is the one that Moses writes of, of course, in Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. Now this is the prophet that they're referring to. Actually, what Moses was talking about here was the fact that once Moses was done with his ministry, God was going to raise up someone who would be a go-between, who would be God's spokesman. But he was also referring to the, you might say, that great prophet that all these other prophets and Moses himself were pointing to, and that is the great prophet. Some understood this prophet to be the Christ, while others quite obviously understood that they were different persons. Actually, those who thought he was the Christ were correct. The prophet was to be the Christ. Elijah would be someone different. But we already know that Elijah had come, and they had already done to him what they desired. That was John the Baptist. John the Baptist was not personally Elijah, as though he had been reincarnated or had come down again from heaven, but he was the one who spoke with the spirit and power of Elijah, and he was the fulfillment of this prophecy and this expectation. So some, again, thought that Jesus was the prophet. As a matter of fact, they were right. They just didn't understand that he was the Christ. But John goes, also, uh, goes on to tell us also in verse 41 that others were saying, this is the Christ. Uh, 
And of course, they were right. They had seen his miracles. They had seen his signs. They heard what it is he had to say. And they rightly concluded, this is the son of David. The Savior God would send into the worlds. And believing that Jesus was the Christ, they received him. But again, not surprisingly, most doubted that he was the Christ. Verses 41 and 42. Still others were saying, Surely the Christ is not going to come from Galilee, is he? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the descendants of David and from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So here again was a group of individuals who didn't believe and were groping for an excuse not to believe, like many people do today. They saw what Jesus had done. Yes, he had done miracles. He had done things that only somebody who had been sent from God could do. And yes, he was doing the things that the scripture said that Messiah would do and only the Messiah would do. Clearly, he was the Messiah. His teaching was was not like the scribes and Pharisees. He spoke with one, like one who had authority. Uh, He spoke as though those words belonged to him. Uh, Nobody, as we're going to see in just a moment, had spoken like this one had spoken, and it was completely in line with God's will. But they said Jesus was from Galilee. Where does it say in Scripture that the Christ would originate from there? Wasn't he supposed to come from the line of David? Wasn't he supposed to be born in Bethlehem, the city of David? Well, we know that he was. And as a matter of fact, he had been. You know, he had come from the line of David. He was born uh, in Jerusalem. Joseph and Mary are both in the line of David. And as we see, of course, every year around Christmas, we understand very well Jesus was born. God made sure he would actually be delivered in Bethlehem, the city of David. Now, apparently, these Jews hadn't read the New Testament. They didn't know this yet. Now, I say that jokingly because sometimes... We tend to think that they knew everything we, we know. Well, we have the New Testament, they don't. But they did know enough. They should have believed. But instead, they hated him. They wanted to seize him. They wanted to arrest him. Now, by the way, we're going to come back in just a few moments to this statement about Galilee. Because, as a matter of fact, the Scriptures did say that the Messiah would come out of Galilee. Now, John notes that there were also others who saw him and heard him and drew their own conclusions. There were the officers that the priests and the uh, rulers had sent to arrest him. These were the, the temple guard. They were the police. They were the ones who were charged with keeping order on the temple grounds. These were the ones, again, I had mentioned that the Pharisees and chief priests had sent earlier to arrest Jesus. What do they think about him? Well, we read in verses 45 and 46 that after listening to him, they couldn't find it within themselves to arrest him. This is what we read. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said to them, why did you not bring him? The officers answered, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. Now, they basically were awed by what Jesus had to say. Well, who were these men, by the way? I think sometimes we read this and we think, well, they're temple police, they must be Romans because they're the ones who are basically charged with keeping order in the city. But these men were not Romans. At least they weren't Gentiles. They were Jewish. Men who had been raised in the synagogues. Men who had heard the Old Testament scriptures since childhood. Men who knew what Moses had written, had read and, well, at least had heard what the prophets had written. And maybe men who had even heard John the Baptist or at least knew what John the Baptist was preaching. But they also knew that when they heard Jesus speak, that there was somebody who was greater who was here. Somebody greater than Moses. Somebody greater than the prophets. Somebody that they did not dare arrest. Now, we don't know whether they believed in Jesus or not, but we do know they weren't willing to run the risk of arresting him. And, of course, there were also the Pharisees. It's clear what they thought about Jesus, which is why they responded as they did. I mean, listen to what they say to the officers as they try to intimidate them in verses 47 through 49. 
The Pharisees then answered them, You have not also been led astray, have you? No one of the rulers or Pharisees has believed in him, has he? But the crowd which does not know the law is accursed. We haven't believed in him. The rulers haven't believed in him. And what they mean, of course, is the Sanhedrin and, and the council. Because we haven't believed in him, you shouldn't either. I mean, we're the experts after all. We should know. If we don't believe, you shouldn't either. And as for this crowd, don't be tempted because they believe in him. What do they know? Basically, they're a group of ignorant people who don't know God's word in the way that we know it. They're basically accursed. Now, these religious leaders, not only were they putting the temple guard down, but they were also calling down a curse on the crowd. These people are cursed for believing that Jesus was the Christ. By the way, I hope you recognize that what they're doing here is a logical fallacy. You know, the argument due to strength or to a superiority of intellect, we can't be wrong. You need to believe the way that we believe. But you do need to understand, I'm sure you do, that just because Israel's religious leaders didn't believe in him doesn't mean that others shouldn't believe in him. Um, and as a matter of fact, the fact that a group of people believe in him doesn't mean that we should believe in him either because both could be wrong. We know the leaders were wrong. You really can't determine truth by opinion. You have to determine truth by the facts. You need to look at the facts and determine what are they saying. Uh, what does the world say about Jesus Christ? They don't think he even existed, many of them. And many people who knew that, or know that he existed believe that he's some kind of a either, well, again, you've heard Lord, liar, a lunatic. They think that he was deceived. He was a religious man, or maybe he was a prophet like some of the other prophets, or, you know, uh, they have a lot of differing opinions. But we don't determine truth by counting heads or by listening to opinions. The only opinion we should receive is what the Lord says in his word. We need to look at the facts. The temple guard was looking at the facts. There was a part of the crowd that was looking at the facts. They saw what Jesus did. They heard what he had to say. We have those things written down as well. We need to make our determination based upon the facts and not opinion. Don't be swayed by others' opinions. Now finally, we see how Nicodemus responded. Verses 50 and 51. Nicodemus, he who came to him before, being one of them, said to them, Our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing, does it? Now this is the same Nicodemus who is both a Pharisee and a ruler of the Jews, the one who came to Jesus by night, the one who, um, who told him that he and others believed that he was from God because of the miracles that he did. Nicodemus, his response was to try and defend Jesus. How can you condemn him without first hearing him? Clearly, that is not what the law of God tells us to do. You're being inconsistent. But again, notice what the Pharisees say to him in verse 52. They answered him, You are not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. What were they saying here? Well, first of all, they're accusing him of being a follower of Jesus. That's what they mean. Are you also from Galilee? They're insinuating that he too was following Jesus. Apparently, they didn't know that, as a matter of fact, that is what he was doing. But second, they belittle his understanding. Search the scriptures, Nicodemus, and see for yourself that the Christ does not come out of Galilee, that the prophet doesn't come. I think they understood the prophet was Christ. Now, they were right about the fact that, again, Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem and he was to come from the line of David, but it's also true that Messiah would come out of Galilee. Matthew writes in Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 16, now, when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, the land of Zebulun and the land of 
Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. And those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. You see, this light that was to arise in the darkness in the region of, of, the, uh, of Galilee of the Gentiles was, of course, the Christ. So the scripture does talk about Christ coming out of Galilee. Either they didn't understand that or their sin blinded them to the truth. Now the last thing we see here is that since the officers failed to bring Jesus, there was no longer any reason to be assembled together. And so everyone went to their own home. So basically, there was division among the people regarding who this Jesus actually is. Many in the crowd believed that he was the Christ. Nicodemus believed that he was the Christ. The officers uh, may have believed that he was the Christ. They certainly were afraid of him for that reason, and they didn't want to arrest him. I think many of them did believe, but there were many who didn't. Many in the crowd, many among the leadership of Israel and as we've seen each one responded or acted according to what they believed regarding Jesus those who believed he was the Christ defended him the, the officers defended him never did a man speak like this man speaks Nicodemus defended him uh, when he said does are we going to condemn him before we have a chance even to hear him and of course many in the crowd before as we saw before though not in this text defended him could, could somebody who is a sinner do what he is doing? Surely when the Christ comes, he's not going to do more than this man did, is he? So they defended him and they believed. Those, of course, who believed acted on that belief, but the ones who didn't believe. What we see is they tried to intimidate, they tried to belittle, they threatened those who did believe. I mean, same thing goes on today. Doesn't that sound familiar today? I mean, you run into somebody who doesn't believe and they'll do exactly the same thing to you. We will respond according to what we believe. We will act consistently with our beliefs. There is a connection between what we believe and what we do. And as a matter of fact, there is such a strong connection between the two that unless the two agree, then we're not being honest with, with our belief system. We're not being honest with ourselves as to what we actually do believe. And so I thought I would apply this this morning by just simply asking uh, the question about what we believe regarding Jesus Christ. I mean, what, what do you believe regarding him? Who do you think he is? And are you living consistent with that belief? I mean, the Lord certainly would have us to do that. Do you uh, here this morning believe as the Pharisees? Do you believe as, as a certain portion of the crowd that he's a liar? Do you believe he's a deceiver? Do you believe he's just a phony? Do you believe, on the other hand, that he is a messenger from God? Do you believe he's a prophet, but maybe not the Christ? Or do you believe that he is, in fact, the Christ, the one God sent into the world, and the only one through whom you can have salvation? Now, if you think that he's a deceiver, he's a liar, he's a phony, of course you're not going to want to listen to him. But if that is what you think, let me just ask whether or not you have come to that conclusion by looking at the facts themselves or by listening to other people. Again, there's a lot of people who say they do not believe in God, who say they don't believe that Jesus is the Christ. But they believe that or they say that because they hate him. They know, but they don't want to acknowledge that they don't, because they don't want to live uh, consistently with that. They want simply to sin because they love their sins. So they're going to continue to deny him as long as they live. Is that why you believe that Jesus is a phony? Are you listening to them or are you looking at the facts? Let me just remind you, if you happen to fall in that category, one day you're going to have to stand before God. And you're going to have to give an answer for your life. Jesus says that on that day, even every idle word that we have spoken is going to be brought up against us if we have not repented and trusted in him. Let me just challenge you that you better make sure that you're right before that day comes, before Jesus 
before you have to stand before him as judge because Jesus is the only one who is going to be able to help you when that day actually does come. He's the only Savior. He's the only Messiah. He's the only one who can deliver you from the, the judgment that he is going to pronounce on that particular day. Make sure that you look at the facts. Make sure that you are looking at things as you should see them. Do you believe this morning that Jesus is merely a prophet as many of these seem to believe and as many Muslims today believe? I mean, they believe Jesus is a prophet, but they don't believe that he's the Christ. They don't believe he's the greatest prophet. They think that uh, Muhammad is the greatest prophet, that Jesus is merely one among many. One who brings us God's word, but who is not the son of God. Well, if that is what you think this morning, I pray that God will open your ears to listen, to actually hear what Jesus says about himself. I mean, Jesus doesn't claim just to be a prophet. Jesus claims to be the prophet. He claims to be the Son of God. And if he is merely a prophet, as Muslims believe, then they have to see him as being a deceiver and a liar. They, they don't accept what he has to say. What he's saying is false. I pray that God would open your ears to hear what Jesus actually says about himself, that he is more than merely a prophet. That as we read in John chapter 1, he is God in your nature. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And that no one comes to God except through him. He is the only way to God. The one you must believe in in order to be saved. Now, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Do you believe he is the only Savior of the world? Well, let me ask you this morning, if you believe that, have you trusted him? I hope if somebody is in peril right now that they have trusted Jesus because you don't want to get into a situation where you need an ambulance and you don't have Jesus Christ that you haven't trusted in him. But if you believe that Jesus Christ is actually the Messiah, that he is the Savior, have you acted upon that belief? Have you actually trusted in him? Have you turned from your sins? I mean, Jesus says you can't just come to him and hold on to your sins. You can't hold on to the world and everything that God tells you to let go of and continue to live your own life and trust in him. Have you let go of those things? And have you received him? Have you looked to him to save you? Well, again, if you haven't done that, you need to ask yourself the question, do you really believe? I mean, do you believe that Jesus is the Messiah? Can you have that belief and still not respond in faith and repentance? Not really. I mean, you might be able to believe that objectively he is the Christ, but you can't believe in the way you need to believe, savingly, unless you actually look to Jesus Christ and trust him Alone. You know, the Bible has other things to say about Jesus as well that I mentioned at the beginning. The Bible says that Jesus is the King of Kings, that Jesus is the Lord of all lords. The Bible says that God has placed Jesus over the entire world to, to rule the world and to govern it as he wills. The Father has said that everyone should obey Jesus Christ. Jesus said on one occasion, to his disciples, why do you call me Lord, and yet you do not do what I say? Jesus has the promise from the Father that one day every knee is going to bow to him. Do you believe those things are true? Do you believe all that? Well, then, are you submitting to him? Are you obeying him? Are you doing what he tells you to do? Are you reading his words so, you, so that you will know what the king of the universe actually wants you to do? You see, if, you, if you're not doing that, then you have to ask yourself, do you really believe that he is the Lord? Again, Jesus says, hey, if you're going to call me Lord, then do what I say. And again, there's a lot that goes into that. There's every reason in the world why we should obey him, not the least of which because what he tells us to do is right. But we're just looking for consistency here. If, he, if you really believe he is the Lord and he is your Lord, are you obeying him? The Bible says that Jesus is not just a prophet, but he is the prophet. 
the one who declares to us the will of God for our salvation, the one who tells us what God expects us to believe, what we should believe, and what he wants us to do. Do you believe that Jesus is the prophet? Well, what would be consistent with that belief? Well, if I believe he's the prophet and he's speaking to me the, the, the word of God, then I should listen to him. Are you listening to Jesus? Are you believing what Jesus Christ says to you through his words? And are you doing what the prophet is telling you is the will of God? Well, that is consistent with that belief. If you're not doing that, do you really believe that Jesus is the prophet? And the Bible says that Jesus is our great high priest. He was the one who was offered a sacrifice, the only sacrifice which can cleanse sin, that he has offered himself once for all, and he's praying for us in heaven. Do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus has actually done that? Well, again, what's consistent with that belief? Looking to Jesus for his sacrifice to cleanse you from your sins. Are you looking to that sacrifice? Are you doing your best to try to avoid sin, realizing that it costs the life of the, the one who is most precious to the Father to free you from God's justice? Or do you take sin lightly and you know, don't really do what it is God calls you to do and, and just live the way you want to live? Well, you see, if you, if you don't look to Jesus Christ, if you don't trust him for his cleansing blood and if you're not seeking to uh, put off your sins and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, you have to ask yourself, do you really believe that he is this great high priest who has offered this sacrifice? If you really believe something is true, you will act on that belief in a way that is consistent with that belief. You know, I think the classic illustration is if a speaker is speaking and says, hey, you know what, there's a bomb underneath here, it's going to go off in 10 seconds. And then you look at the speaker and you wonder, is he really telling the truth? Well, if he stands there and continues not to do anything about it, you'd have to question. Does he really believe that? Well, if he cares about his life, he would be running, but he's not. So I don't believe it. So you wouldn't believe because he's not acting consistently with his belief. And the same thing is true here. If there is something you really believe you will act consistent with that. And by the way, I'm going to uh, apply that this evening as well. You know, if, if we really believe there are certain things that God values more than other things, that he delights in, that he wants to see in us and that he will bless in us, aren't those things that we should want to put on, things that we might want to do because we want to please him and because we want his blessing? Do we really believe? Now again, in this case, we ask this question, are you living in a way that is generally consistent with what you believe regarding Jesus? And we can't say perfectly consistent because even the best of us are all imperfect and we're never going to be perfectly consistent. But there should be a general consistency in what we say and what we do. Is the way we live consistent with what we say we believe? If it isn't, then maybe we really don't believe what we think we believe. Now, one thing we can know for sure, that on that final day when we have to stand before the Lord, the Lord isn't going to be too concerned about what we said, okay? And he's not going to be terribly concerned about what we thought, about ourselves and what kind of opinion we had about ourselves. But we do know this, that the Lord is going to look at what we did, at how we lived, at what we said, at how we served, because how we live really will show what we believe and whether or not we loved him and were committed to him and whether we submitted to Christ as our king, whether we listened to him as prophet and whether we received his sacrifice as our priest. It will show whether we believe that he really was a deceiver or whether he was just merely a prophet or whether he was the Christ. How we live, what we do, what we say, the fruit of our lives will show what kind of a tree we actually are. 
So take a good look at your life. We all need to examine ourselves to see if we are living consistently, generally consistently with what we say we believe. If we are not, we're in a good position right now because it's not too late to do something about it. We can repent. The scripture says that if a man who is sinning, woman or child, sinning, turns away from their sin and begins to do what is right, that everything that we have done that's wrong will no longer be remembered against us, but only the things that we do that are good. That's a wonderful promise. If we're living inconsistently, we can come to Jesus. We can look to Him for His grace. We can trust in Him for His forgiveness and His cleansing and to clothe us with His righteousness and to give us the strength to do what it is we need to do, which is to live consistently with what it is that we actually believe. And so may the Lord grant us that grace this morning to be able to do that. And particularly as we prepare to come to the Lord's table, because the Lord tells us that our lives do need to measure up, they do need to be consistent with what we believe, it needs to be consistent with what a Christian is before we come to the table. So let's spend just a, a few moments now in silent prayer and let's, let's ask the Lord to help us search our hearts and to see where we're at and to respond accordingly.